Welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Lili Mo. Uh, so Lili is one of the leaders in natural language processing. Uh, so he did, um, well, he is currently a, a professor at the University of Alberta. Uh, okay, assistant <laughs> professor at the University of Alberta, but clearly, you know, on his way to become a full professor too. <laughs> and um, yeah, he's also a CIFAR AI chair at uh, uh, Amy. Uh, he also won some awards, um, so he was he received a, a highlight uh, a highlighting uh, award from AAAI in 2021. Uh, he also gave uh, some very interesting tutorials in the past on, on some important topics in, in NLP. And uh, today he's going to tell us about uh, how to do non-autoregressive regressive text generation, which is very important, I guess, uh, for speeding things up and and improving, I guess, the efficiency of, of uh, uh, large language models in, in general. Okay, so without any uh, further ado, let's welcome uh, Lili. Yeah. My own mic. Um, yeah, thanks, Pascal, for the introduction. And today my talk is on uh, non-autoaggressive text generation uh, with challenges and opportunities. So I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Computing Science and also Amy. So actually Amy is the sister institute of Factor. So we have three AI institutes in Canada, Amy, Factor, and Amy, Miller, and Factor. Actually for the alphabetic order, you know, Amy always goes first. <laughs> That's the list in the CIFAR, but uh, actually we are slightly less known than Mila or Factor. And uh, actually we have a lot of AI faculty members there. And if any of you uh, or your friends are interested in opportunities there, feel free to contact me. And uh, we actually, we're actually very close to the Canadian Rockies. So it's possible to do a day trip into the mountains. And I know many people from Toronto do vacations <laughs> in, uh, in Alberta, just in the Banff or Jasper National Park, but just a couple of hours away from our side. Okay, so um, for today, uh, the topic here is non-autoaggressive text generation. I'm gonna introduce what is that and uh, why we care about the problem. And then we have some design to improve the performance of the non-aggressive model. And then we find that uh, non-aggressive models bring unique opportunities to do control text generation. So I'm gonna show some uh, papers, recent papers to perform land control for non autoaggressive generation and finally conclusion of the work. Um, so for text generation, uh, I guess it's uh, very well known, especially with the you know, help of ChatGPT. Basically you type something and the system can generate a piece, piece of text or uh, that's basically text generation. It has wide applications, for example, uh, summarization or machine translation uh, let's say if you go to a foreign country, you don't know the language, you feed it into a system and it can generate a language that you know. Uh, for example, if you feed in a German sentence, thank uh, you, the meaning is just thank you. So if a system can generate thank you, then you know what it means. So traditionally, text generation is done in an autoregressive way. So we still take machine translation as an example. Uh, what they do is you feed in the source language, you feed in the German sentence, and then you hope to generate the target sentence, the sentence in the target language. What you do is you generate the, uh, you factorize the conditional probability of the target sentence given the input sentence in a way that uh, you do it word by word. So what you do is you first, uh, you know, feed in the Danke Schon, and then you have a signal, you know, a starting token saying, okay, you're gonna generate. Then the decoder, the generator will say, okay, the first word is thank. Then given thank, so you're gonna feed the thank in, and you're gonna generate you. And then given you, uh, probably you're done, then you generate the last token, which is end of sequence. So it's done in, an, in a token by token way. It's a autoregressive generation. The main problem for autoregressive generation is that it's slow. And uh, the reason is, you know, during inference, let's say your sentence is 50 words, uh, every word uh, blocks the future words. So you have to do it for the first word and then the second word and so forth. You can't do it in parallel. So the longer the sequence will be, the slower it's gonna be. 
So that's the main issue for other regressive generation. So uh, I guess in around 2017, people are looking for non-auto aggressive generation. Uh, it basically says, uh, instead of having the conditional factorization, why not let's assume given the input source, uh, the target words are independent. So instead of generating thank and you in sequence, I'm gonna predict the two words in parallel. Then, you know, you think of um, maybe a sentence of 10 words, or maybe 20 words, uh, it's typically 10 times faster. So it's way, way more efficient than the other aggressive generation because other words can be predicted in parallel. But the problem for non-aggressive generation is that the output quality is much lower than other aggressive models because uh, it's easy to see that, uh, you know, given this German sentence, there are two, let's assume there are two uh, alternative transla tra translations, either many thanks or thank you, and let's assume the chance is 50 by 50. So you either say many thanks or say thank you, it's basically the same thing. So uh, non-aggressive generation, uh, in non-aggressive generation, the decoder, the generator doesn't know, they predict all the steps in parallel. So it doesn't know which word is predicted in the first step when it generates the second word. So it's possible that the model says, okay, uh, thank, thanks. Because uh, you know, when you generate the second word, you don't really have an idea what the first word is. So it's possible to be thank, thanks. Or maybe it says many you, and none of them make any sense. So that's why this is the main reason autoaggressive generation, uh, non-autoaggressive generation is way more complicated than autoaggressive. Uh, you lose the dependencies and you have the consistency issue. And this is also sometimes known as multimodality because uh, you think of the output as a distribution, although the distribution is factorized into different steps. And uh, each of them is a mode, it's a plausible, uh, uh, possible, um, you know, a peak in your output distribution. So these, things, these two things are the modes of the distribution. But then how to maintain the consistency will be a challenge. So this isn't a problem in autoaggressive generation because autoaggressive generation says uh, the output tokens are predicted one by one. So you know, still in that example, you can either say many thanks or thank you. You generate the first word thank or many, it doesn't really matter. So let's assume you generate thank, then the thank will be fed to the generator. It will be fed back. Okay, and then given the first word, thanks, you know I'm gonna generate you almost surely. So that's why uh, other aggressive generation is way easier than non aggressive generation. The performance is way better, or it works way better. And you can do it all the way down. And what if you happen to generate many at the beginning, it doesn't matter. So when you feed in the word many, you'll gen generate thanks. But such dependency mechanism is missing in non-aggressive generation. So that's basically the main challenge for NAR, uh, which is to maintaining to maintain the consistency of different steps. So therefore, in the first paper that I'm going to introduce, I uh, I will present a paper last year, Triple AI uh, of ours, doing deeply supervised layer-wise prediction for um, calibration during the decoder, uh, during the generation. So the basic idea is this. Uh, let's think of a vanilla non-aggressive generation, uh, you know, just a straight up uh, transformer model. Uh, I, I don't know how much you know about transformer. It's basically a deep neural network. And then for every layer, you're gonna have attention to other uh, steps, okay? And including yourself, so you have self-attention um, to yourself and other steps. And then you have multiple layers, so you just go straight up, this is the encoder. For the decoder, uh, it's basically the same thing, you have a transformer with attention going straight up with some attention to the encoder. So you are not only aware of different decoder steps of their hidden state, but also the encoder information. So at the end of the day, you're just gonna predict the two words in parallel. So this is a traditional non-aggressive model. And our intuition is that during the deep decoding, uh, attention is 
uh, you know, some kind of awareness, but based on hidden features. So this hidden feature says, I contain the information about, uh, you know, the input tokens as well as the, you know, the decoder step specific information here, and it's attended to other steps. But such information is soft, it's uh, real valued, uh, you know, vectors. It doesn't tell which word it is. So, um, so our idea is why not, let's say, the, at every decoder layer, we not only could have the features add to the last, to the next layer, but also we do a draft prediction. So we first predict uh, a draft. And this draft must be a concrete word, a specific word. And this word will be fed to the next layer. And the next layer is the well of your preference, which you are likely to predict in your previous layer. And the next layer will do some, um, you know, calibration. So you're going to predict, do another draft prediction, and it will be fed to the even further layers. So and so forth, uh, the decoder layers are doing some kind of calibration, and uh, it can improve the consistency issue. So basically, what we did was, uh, this is a super simple model. Uh, what we did is you just have a, a softmax predictor of the words at every step, and then you feed the generated word to the next layer, and you do it all the way up, and uh, it's our uh, layer-wise prediction model. To make the prediction, you know, of the, to make the draft prediction meaningful, we need to have the deep decision uh, basically, we're going to have a supervised learning for every layer. So each layer is taught to predict the output. Maybe the prediction is not so great at the lower layers. Uh, it won't be a problem. So you have more layers to calibrate, to do uh, more complex information processing. And until the end of the day, you're going to generate the, uh, you're going to have the desired output. So this is deep situation. You just apply the loss to every layer. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. And we don't have bad props because it's a deep decision. You know what to generate this layer and this layer. You just, uh, you know, use the ground truth. We're doing suicide learning, so you have the ground truth output sequence, you just apply the loss to every layer. Uh, each layer has a layer-wide loss. Yes. And that loss is um, The loss is back prop to the previous layers by the hidden the connections. Layer. Yeah, but it's not back prop to the predicted hard token. And of course, this uh, leads to a problem that there is a discrepancy between training and inference, because during training, you are always feeding in the ground truth token, uh, you know. And during inference, you are feeding your predict token. That's why we have a mixed training mechanism um, saying that uh, during training, your bad words for those layers, they can be either ground truth token or they can be your own prediction. So it's a way to mitigate the exposure bias problem. But overall, we don't have the bad prop to the argument that's uh, you know, a little bit tricky. Sometimes you can do gumbo soft math. Sometimes you can do reinforcement learning, but the, uh, they, they have their own issues. For example, too noisy or uh, the gradient estimate is not so great. And it doesn't compensate the benefit you bring by that problem. I, uh, uh, good question. I should bring the student here. I don't know. I don't know the details. Maybe the student have tried that and it doesn't uh, give good performance. But uh, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not fully aware of the details. But in general, this model you can see it already performs pretty well. Um, yeah, this, this is basically the summary of this approach. Uh, you have the layer-wise prediction. You fight in a deep fashion. You just have a layer-wise decision, and then we have a mixed training strategy.
and our results are, uh, you know, um, four data sets, uh, basically two translation pairs. So we have four experiments. Our um, other models are transformer based, but we can have different, uh, you know, base models. For example, the vanilla model and uh, this is conditional mass language models, which is an iterative editing approach or some glass training objective or uh, CTC decoding methods. Um, basically, we can see with our approach, uh, you know, we basically improve the performance by one or one or one point five points for each of the models. So it's pretty consistent over different translation pairs. Uh, so basically, it says our approach really works. And uh, uh, comparing this is a comparison against state of the art models, and we can see, um, you know, these are previous non-aggressive models and our results are uh, higher than most of the models. And sometimes it's even higher than the um, other aggressive ones. So it basically says the room for improvement is minimum. Um, you don't expect this number can exceed this number by two large margins. Maybe slightly higher, still some noise or somehow it's better, but it won't be much better than other aggressive models. So that's why that's another reason we haven't exhausted any possibilities. It's almost good. Our model performs well. And this is the balance between speed up and uh, uh, the quality of output. You can see our, uh, our method is rocketing up uh, in different base models. We also did some analysis about the decoder layers, for example, um, Okay, uh, yes, we, we did some analysis with three variants, six layers, 12 layer, or 18 layers. And we can see, we did an ablation study, we can see uh, layer-wise prediction and deep division are both important. They, they need to work together to get the performance improvement. And this is understandable because if you don't have the deep division, um, the predicted tokens, the draft predictions are not so meaningful. So it doesn't calibrate very well. But if you don't really predict, you just apply the deep decision on the hidden state, you still don't know their choice. That's why you need to combine them. And also, yeah. Yeah, for the ablation study, we don't have the autoregressive prediction, but for the joint table, our first line is autoregressive model, uh, which is the transformer model. We can see our results are pretty close. For some of the translation directions, our result is even higher in terms of blue score. Uh, but uh, blue score is not everything about translation. There could be some other aspects, for example, the novelty of your words, uh, maybe less than autoregressive model. Um, you mean for the draft prediction? Yeah, the draft, the draft prediction is, used, uh, is put to the next layer. Then the next layer will have another draft prediction to the uh, next, next layer. Yeah. So and so forth until the last of the la last layer, it will accept the last draft, list, draft yeah, prediction and it will, yeah, oh. it will predict the final output. Okay, so we also did some analysis about the performance. It shows that the performance is somehow improving, or uh, you know, uh, layer by layer. And also we checked the calibration, just like how many words are changed. So you see the changes are less and less. So it's kind of stable, stabilized.
Yes, so that's a Yes, that's a very good question. Um, that's what we observe in practice, and that's theoretically wrong. So that's a essentially our approach is a synchronized update of metropolis hissing. So metropolis hissing is that you have to update one word at a time. Otherwise, you can uh, calibrate to each other, and then you are async again. You know, the metropolis hissing is that you have to update one variable at a time, and then you update another variable based on the other variable. Then you will converge. So you can do synchronous updates. But since the transformer layer, you know, transformer model only have 10, work, 10 steps, you can't do too many metropolis hissing updates. So we just do a parallel version of metropolis hissing. So it's theoretically wrong, but empirically it works pretty well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, I guess yes. Your every layer is trying to predict the target. So you have a goal in mind, and then uh, you're gonna approach the goal. And here, are the number of edits uh, or the ratio of edits at, at every layer. So you can see uh, with more layers, you're gonna have less edits. Uh, that is kind of an empirical convergence. And uh, here are some case studies. Uh, you know, one thing you notice is that non-aggressive models tend to repeat a word, and repeat a, maybe a keyword, because uh, there are many ways to say this. Would I need, uh, then you can say, uh, is it possible that I need? Then you have a few words here, then you don't know when you generate the word meet, you don't really know the uh, precise location of the word meet. So it's possible to uh, repeat the word at different steps. So this is what layer one does. But then over the calibration, which is a synchronous metropolis <laughs> hissing calibration, uh, you're gonna revise it out. You will say, but I only need the uh, mind, uh, you know, minded people at the dark darkness. Uh, but of course, it's not fully solved because here dark is repeated again, so dark darkness, which is not um, great, but it's much better. Okay, so this is the uh, first work that I tend to show. It's a simple approach. You just have a layer-wise calibration and you go all the way up. So, uh, we started non-aggressive generation by the simple approach, and we are thinking of what is the real benefit for non-aggressive generation. So in the literature, most people trade, uh, they, they do NAR to trade the performance for efficiency. They claim, okay, I'm 10 times faster, um, but uh, my performance goes down. And with some uh, heavily engineered approach like ours, we can achieve similar uh, blue scores, but still slightly lower. I'm thinking of uh, whether NAR brings any opportunities. So is it possible that NAR can actually do better than AR, at least in some aspects? So uh, our intuition is that uh, non-aggressive models predict their probability independently. So all the words probability are simultaneously predicted. They are not conditionally dependent on each other. So you have local probabilities. When you have local probabilities, it's likely that you can do dynamic programming. So you have a, a big problem of, let's say, generating a whole sentence. Then I can divide it to a problem of generating a subsequence. There are local problems. And then um, since the problems are local, you can share the sub problem. So what if I generated a subsequent so far? Then it doesn't really matter how you generate them. It's just up to here. So that's why um, it's possible to design some dynamic programming algorithms for NAR models, and which can be more beneficial than uh, AR models. So now we have the hammer, where's the problem? So the problem we looked at was length control text generation. So basically, 
uh, you think of generating a land L problem, you divide it to, uh, you have a divide and conquer algorithm. You have a land L minus one, and then L minus, uh, L minus two problem. And the sub problems are shared, so you can do a very precise land control based on NL model. So for land control, the application scenario is summarization task. Uh, for example, uh, you can generate a news headline, so you have a whole article and you just generate a summary, like a one sentence. So this is known as sentence level summarization in the NLP literature. Uh, here are some examples. You have a very long sentence and you just extract some of the key information. Um, So to do that with our non-aggressive model and some land control mechanism, we propose a you know, straight up uh, encoder-only non-aggressive model. It basically just a transformer model, just like a bird or just a straight up transformer model. You have the input uh, at, the, at the lowest layer and then you just have multiple layers. At the end of the day, you just predict the word uh, for each layer. But the only problem is that uh, if you predict every word for every step, then the output will not be much shorter. It's actually not, it's, it's actually the same length as the input. So it's not a summary. Summary must be shorter. So that's why we have the epsilon tokens inserted in different places. So you can generate an epsilon at the place if you want. And if you have many, many epsilons all the way uh, in the sequence, then uh, the output sentence will be uh, shorter and it can be a summary of the input. And another benefit for this type of architecture is that uh, summarizations are actually very extractive. So basically, if you take an input and if you can extract a few words and you just uh, put it here, you just extract a few words, it's fairly good. So if you do an upper bound analysis, the performance is fairly high. Then the transformer architecture actually has the uh, skip connection. So the information is uh, mostly preserved for its own step, although it has some attention to other steps. So it's mostly preserved. Then uh, it gives you the you know, better encoder or the input-output correspondence. So this architecture, although it's simple, it's pretty, uh, pretty good for summarization. Now the question is, uh, we have, we allow different epsilons inserted in different places, but how can we train the model? So we use the CTC model known as connectionist uh, temporal classification model, which is a marginalization of different epsilons. So you can insert epsilon here or there, but uh, no matter how you insert them, you will sum the probability together and eventually you uh, maximize the marginal probability no matter how you insert the epsilon. And this can be done by a dynamic programming uh, algorithm uh, in the Alex paper, uh, it's kind of a, a speech paper, where they try to align the speech and the uh, syllables, they will insert some epsilon as well. So this is a known algorithm, and uh, I'm not gonna introduce this algorithm here. But uh, we designed a similar algorithm or another dynamic program algorithm for land control generation. So as I mentioned, the basic idea is you can do divide and conquer and the subproblems are shared, uh, then uh, you can do DP. So we define the recursive variable BST as the most probable keyword summary given the first S model token output. So you use up S log. And uh, for those epsilon, there could be some epsilon, and you delete those epsilon, you'll get keywords. This is the uh, recursive variable, BST, you use epsilon to generate keywords. So obviously the base cases will be B10, which says uh, you use one slot and you generate zero words. So this word, this slot can only generate epsilon. So B10 will be just one epsilon because you generate uh, one word you use one slot to generate zero words. B11 will be the most powerful words in the first output, excluding epsilon, because you use one slot, but you also generate one word. So this word must not be epsilon. So these are the base cases. For the recursion, 
uh, the dynamic programming recursion, we can divide it into several cases. For example, if the next word is epsilon, um, you use up one more slot. So the index for the generation slot goes from S minus one to S. So you are not generating new words. So that goes from T to T as well. So this is case one. If the next word is epsilon, you increment the generation slot, so you don't increment the uh, word, number of words. And there are many other cases. For example, if you are generating an actual word, now your uh, you know, index should, be, should go from S minus one to S and T minus one to T because you are generating uh, one, one more uh, word uh, with one more slot. So that's why uh, that's another case. And eventually you will take the maximum for all these cases. That's the dynamic. Uh, programming recursion. So there's one complication that uh, in the CTC algorithm it merges repetitive tokens. So if you have a sentence, let's say, in, in addition to epsilon, it first deletes epsilon token. But uh, in addition to that, it will merge repetitive tokens. For example, I like, like, like reading. Uh, that's a valid output and it will be reduced to I like reading. And the reason for doing that is as what you can see in the previous example, uh, non-aggressive models tend to repeat. So it will merge the repetitive token. So in this case, our dynamic programming is no longer exact because such kind of re uh, repetition establishes the dependency. So when you generate this token like, the probability of like is not exactly what it predicted. But also it asks, did you have like for the previous step? So it somehow establishes the dependencies and make our dynamic programming approximate algorithm. So to mitigate this issue, uh, I'm going to have a bean search dynamic programming algorithm. So instead of maintaining one most probable T word, I'm going to have top K probable T word. Uh, then for the base cases, uh, for, sorry, for the, uh, you know, the, Recursion cases, you just put them here. Instead of having max, you're gonna have top. And eventually you're gonna uh, merge the, the three cases. Uh, you, you're not gonna have max, max either. You're gonna have top K. And in this way, it mitigates the inexactness of the, uh, you know, the dynamic programming algorithm due to the dependencies, the slight dependencies brought by uh, removing repetition. And empirically, the performance goes up a little bit, and then it somehow goes down, or it's somehow uh, not very consistent. Uh, it's similar to being search for general decoding. You know, we know it's not necessarily the larger beam size, the better performance. It will peak at a beam of five, and then it goes down. So it's similar at the same time. It's, yeah. Overall, our results show that um, our length control algorithm is way better from, uh, you know, uh, truncating because truncating says uh, if you generate a long sequence and I'm going to truncate the rest of the uh, output and the remaining partial sequence is not complete and it's not so fluent. And it's also better than some previous work where you have some length penalties um, it doesn't control the length very well, and uh, the performance is also worse than ours. In terms of the efficiency, I guess our approach is still efficient. So um, our baseline here is the search-based algorithm. It's a discrete search algorithm, so it's super slow. But uh, after having the, you know, the non-aggressive model can be 2,000 times faster, but uh, even having the length control algorithm is still way faster than the previous search-based method. And it's also better than some, you know, traditional transformer models. We also did the experiments on another data set and the results are just the same. One more interesting thing is that our length control algorithm is purely a decoding algorithm. It's, um, it's not a training algorithm. So you can do length transfer generation. Uh, for example, you train on a length longer sequences and uh, given the budget of your output, you can do even shorter 
generation or longer generation as you like. So therefore, we did the length transfer generation uh, from either uh, you know long to short transfer or short to long transfer. We can see our approach. Uh, long to short transfer is way better than a previous method, which has a length penalty. So length penalty is a soft transfer, soft constraint, because you have the penalty, you don't have to satisfy that. Uh, but uh, our approach is a hard constraint. It's better than this. And for the length penalty, you cannot do short to long generation, because even if you don't have the penalty, you just generate the length of what you have been trained. Uh, but we can do short to long transfer generation, and it's also um, I guess it's also decent performance. Any questions about this? Yeah. Because our decoding algorithm, our algorithm is a decoding only algorithm. Um, so you can fill in this table from top left to bottom right. And then, uh, you know, as long as you have a budget of, let's say, K or T, you just pick the T row. And uh, you use up your slot, for example, here. You just pick the number here. Just you pick a uh, cell, and the corresponding length is what you want. So if you want to have a longer sequence, you just go this table further to the bottom right, and you put a uh, maybe <laughs> a cell in that room. There you get it. Yeah. Correct. Um, but uh, the caveat is. Uh, you definitely have a region of, uh, you know, reasonable output. For example, if my constraint is one word, all I can say is great. And it's not, uh, you know, a meaningful attack. But uh, as long as you have some good region, uh, it would be almost good. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, when we have top K, uh, oh, you can think of it 3D table, but uh, there's no difference between different slices of those K. So the uh, transition, uh, you know, you just you, you just choose every uh, sub subsequence in that top key beam. So that's why you can just treat the uh, this beam as a set. So you don't have to allocate another dimension because there's no difference between different slices here. All the slices are treated equally. So you just say this is a set. It has, let's say, five uh, candidate sequences. That's a very good question. Um, I'm not fully sure about the results um, of different beams, but I suspect it's not too different uh, because the performance improvement is uh, one delta r. One delta r means uh, you know r is the root score. And the delta R is the sum of the uh, three root scores, R1, R2, RL. So basically 0.3 improvement is not too different. And if for the next paper, we show we, we saw that beam search doesn't improve the performance, so we just choose greedy beam. Uh, yeah, beam search doesn't improve the performance, so we chose uh, greedy dynamic programming as an approximate. So I guess we were inspired by our own work for length control text generation that we can exactly control the number of uh, words. Um, and we also have, uh, um, we also try to look for other controlling stuff. And uh, the next thing we looked at was character level length control. So uh, instead of specifying the number of words, I'm going to specify the number of characters I can generate in a sequence. Um, 
the motivation for doing that is uh, it has first it has real world applications. For example, if you have headlines in your mobile app, it doesn't really matter how many words you have, but uh, ideally it should not go two lines. If you have uh, one word in the new line, it's pretty annoying. Or LED display, you want to show the whole sequence on the display. You don't want to have it scrolling. Uh, and also, in summarization systems, actually many evaluation metrics uh, truncate the lens. So no matter how you fit, they just truncate the, uh, the sequence, the fat sequence for evaluation. But our algorithm usually don't do that. So there's a gap between your evaluation script, the evaluation methodology, and the uh, approach. And also, you know, it's possible to design a different algorithm or a similar algorithm. So we just tried again, and uh, we uh, model it as a knapsack problem. Uh, the basic idea is uh, here the hard constraint is the number of characters. So a NAPSAC problem, you know, you have the hard constraint and you have a soft objective. The constraint here is the hard weight. You want to put several objects in your backpack and then, you know, um, the weight is the hard constraint, so it's number of characters. The values will be your optimization objective. So here is the predicted log probability. So overall, we want to maximize the total values, which is the sum of the log probabilities, subject to uh, when you reduce the sequence to your words, let's say uh, epsilon has a length of zero, but uh, if you delete all the epsilon, your length will be less than the budget. So this is our uh, formulation for the character level length control problem. And here, there's a caveat that this is not a standard zero-one knapsack problem, because uh, standard zero-one knapsack problem says uh, the value of an object doesn't change. It's stationary. So you can pick this or pick that at different steps. Uh, it doesn't matter how you pick them. But here, the value of an object evolves over time. So for this step, if you have this word uh, with higher probability, it doesn't mean that this word has a high probability for the next step. So it's not necessarily, necessarily a, a, you know, standard zero one problem. And also, um, zero one problem for, you know, for step, for every step, um, you, you don't have to pick something. But here, uh, in, you know, in our problem, you have to generate um, a word or a token at every step. It can either be a real word or it can be an absolute token. So you have to generate something. Uh, therefore, our work, um, in our formulation, we can work with negative value. But in a standard 01 NAPTAC problem, it's usually a positive value problem. But here we can do a negative value because you have to choose one, then it can be um, you know, negative. It doesn't matter, you just compare among yourself. So now we can imagine that we're going to do the dynamic programming once again. And uh, here is the number of words generated. Here is the, um, here's the generation stack block. Here is the length. And uh, instead of having a you know, character by character um, bucket, we, we decide to group them in a larger bucket of five words, for example, uh, because when you have a grand granularity of one word, that's manageable. But if you have a granularity of one character and you have, let's say, 50 characters, uh, it's too fine grained. So it's not uh, very efficient. And also, it's not so meaningful. Let's say you have one more character. It doesn't matter that much. Therefore, we have a bucket treatment saying that uh, you, know, you have zero words here and then uh, zero characters here. And then for each five characters, you're going to group them together. And our, this time our DT algorithm works in, uh, um, you, know, you know, in a very similar way. So we define a recursion variable DSL uh, where you predict most probable S token sequence. That is, we reduce the summary length in that L bucket, okay? And for the initialization, you're gonna have L equals zero and S equals one. L equals, L equals zero means that it can only be epsilon, so it's epsilon all the way here. And uh, S equals one means the generation slot is one, 
And uh, for the first cell here, it's epsilon. But, but for cells here, it's not epsilon. You just choose the bad word here that falls into the bucket. And for the recursion, again, you're going to have uh, three cases. You have you predict epsilon, then uh, generation is large. It's increased by one, but the length is not increased. Uh, if you're generating a repeated token, then again, the generation slot is uh, great in increased by one, but the, um, you know, the length is not increased. Or otherwise, uh, if you are generating a real, a, a real token, a real word, then you're going to move the cell to the corresponding place. So you will check what is the length of the, how many characters are there for the next word, then you're going to move it accordingly. And eventually, you will take the max for these three cases. Uh, in principle, you can also do bin search, but we found bin search doesn't help at all in this case, so we do on max. And the theorem says if your bucket size is one uh, and you don't merge the consecutive tokens, then the dynamic program is exact, otherwise, it's in the exact. For the results, um, again, we'll, we mainly compare our approach to uh, land control, sorry, con our land control algorithm to truncating. We see that most of the time uh, we will improve the performance except for root two. Root two is the bigram uh, overlapping. So if you, your text is more generative, then you have a lower uh, bigram overlapping. But if your you truncate, you just generate a sequence on your own, and uh, you probably hit more for the bigram. Uh, but for other root scores, always better. And overall, we got an improvement of um, like four points or five points total root scores while keeping our algorithm efficient. We also compared our approach with autoregressive model. And we can see in this case, our model is admittedly lower than the autoregressive model by a fairly large margin. margin. Uh, but uh, we can also see that uh, for length control algorithm, our length control algorithm, it doesn't work with autoregressive model. So if you apply our algorithm to autoregressive model, uh, the performance is lower than this truncate. So the reason is that we rely on the assumption that the probabilities are predicted local. So if you have the dependencies on the predicted probabilities, it doesn't work. And here, here is the case study. Uh, I guess, um, you know, here, uh, if you do auto aggressive generation without length control, the output can be long sometimes. And uh, if you do want to truncate, uh, the last word may not be complete, and the semantic is also corrupted. And if you do non autoregressive generation, you hope you hope that the epsilon can be inserted for a uh, correct number of steps, but uh, sometimes it's not ideal. It can be also long. But our length control is more precise, uh, and the generated output is reasonable. Sometimes it's um, less fluent with some local problems, but in general, it's good. Okay, so I guess I, I, guess I forgot to have a conclusion uh, slide. Uh, sometimes there are different versions of my slides and they are shuffled around. So basically that's all I wish to share in this talk. So we talk about the, uh, um, non-aggressive generation models. We first present a simple architecture that you have a draft prediction in the middle, and then you're gonna um, calibrate through the deep decoder layers. For the second part, we talk about some dynamic programming algorithms for land control. Uh, the basic idea is the predictive probabilities are local, so you can divide a big problem to share small problems, and then you can fill in the table to uh, do precise control. Some of our current work is uh, we can also do length control, but with a different model. For example, if you have heard of the AT model, which is not a monotonic path of generation. So here, this generation is monotonic, but uh, some DAT model is not necessarily monotonic. It has a linkage uh, 
among the generation steps, then you can also design a dynamic programming algorithm on that. Uh, some other applications include lexical control, where your goal is not the length. So the controlling factor is not the length, but uh, whether your lexicon, the target words, are satisfied or not. So you can say, if it's set it so far, then we are good. You, you have three generation, but it's not satisfied, then you need to look at the uh, target words. So these are other possible controlling factors uh, in this direction. Overall, we believe uh, non-aggressive generation is a challenging approach, but uh, with some engineering, it achieves reasonable performance, competitive performance to other aggressive generation, and it brings new opportunities for controlling texture. Um, for non-aggressive generation. Okay. okay, it doesn't work very well because um, because the information is not there. Let's say this. Uh, the information is not there. Uh, when you translate this sentence to English, I don't read German, but uh, let's assume the minutes would I be forced to meet like-minded people only after dark then there are many ways to generate the sentence itself. So for example, would I meet, or am I forced to meet, or is it true that I'm forced to meet? There are many ways to express the same thing, and uh, the machine will never know. It, it doesn't matter how you train, how you design the uh, laws, or how you design the decoding algorithm, uh, unless you establish the dependencies, uh, you will not be able to uh, of the problem. It is, this is the nature of the task. It's not the machine learning model's problem. Yeah, I was just wondering if you mentioned about like, the whole fidelity. Yeah. Look at one whole Yeah, the machine learning model cannot break the symmetry, but uh, there are other ways. For example, I didn't mention the details. For example, uh, we do a distillation. Uh, before training. So we don't train the non-aggressive model from the training set, the human annotated data set, because that's more diverse. We train the non-aggressive model from an uh, autoaggressive model. So an autoaggressive model can be thought of as a, you know, simplified data set. So if you believe, suppose you believe a machine is not as smart as a human, then you think of human's output is more diverse, but the machine's model is less diverse. So you train from the machine's output, the autoaggressive model's output for the non-aggressive model. That works better. So that breaks the symmetry. Yeah. Non-aggressive, yes. So you are not training the non-aggressive model from human annotated data, but training train it from the autoaggressive teacher. Oh, yes. So 
that's a very good question. Um, when you try to edit a sentence that's known as, they call it iterative refinement, indeed the performance can be better than autoaggressive models. Um, but when I say non-aggressive model is not gonna be better than autoaggressive model, I mean that in the plain setting, uh, you know, if you just predict 50 words one by one versus predicting 50 words simultaneously, it's not gonna be, um, I feel the hope of predicting those 50 words simultaneously will be worse. But when you try to do editing, it's actually another discussion about whether the editing are autoaggressive or not. So are the editing are sequential or not? You can do either sequential editing or you can do parallel editing. And it turns out that sequential editing is better than parallel editing for obvious reasons because Machopsis Hastings asks you to <laughs> update one variable at a time or block update but you cannot um, just uh, reshuffle all the variables uh, at a time. So that's why even for uh, iterative refinement, it's usually better that it's better to do it sequentially or in a block fashion than to update a few at a time. But uh, if you do iterative refinement, oh, do I have that? Am I running out of battery? Okay. That's very interesting. So if you do iterative refinement, if you do it for time 10 steps, for example, the speed up is way lower than, you know, uh, you do it once. So it's, uh, you always have the sequential update or generation, then you probably get better performance, but then the speed up is lower. Of course I turn it off, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so here you see if you do 10 steps of iterative refinement, uh, the performance is actually better than you do it once if you check compare line six versus line 11. Uh, the gap is fairly large in terms of performance, but then in terms of the speed up, the gap is still very large. Yeah, 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 indeed, uh, we tried. And also we thought of something, I think it's kind of interesting. For example, you have 50 words. MCMC MC, MC asks you to precisely do sequential updates. So what if I can do some updates for a few steps with uh, less mutual information? So you don't interfere each other and I can update you in parallel. But the only problem is, now performance almost saturates. Uh, there's little hope to publish another paper with that fancy model because <laughs> even if we have that fancy model, the performance may be lower than this because it's less engineered. And then uh, even if it's better than this by 0.3 or 0.2, it won't be a next paper. And uh, um, you know, this is our teacher model. So our gap is pretty small. So that's why I feel uh, we're not up there. So it's, this is still a valid idea, and I believe it can be beneficial in some cases, but uh, not on this task. So we need to find the, we have a hammer now, we have another hammer now, we need to find the problem. This is also a general problem for empirical studies. Sometimes we have a very fancy algorithm, but the performance saturates, and we have to try a different problem. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I guess it's still difficult to determine how to um, choose, like whether the information for this token is needed or not. But I can tell other tricks. For example, other tricks to speed up without all these things. Um, one, I clear paper says, 
you know, it doesn't really matter. The boundary between encoder and decoder isn't so clear. You call it encoder, decoder because of the cross attention, but I can say this part is the decoder, this part, it doesn't really matter. So one IP paper says, why not let's, let's build a deep encoder model? The encoder model can be done in parallel. The only problem is the decoder, then I have a shallow decoder. It just has one layer, and then you just feed in one word, one at a time. Then it shows you get a fairly good speed up. Uh, without going to the non auto aggressiveness. You just have a deep encoder, but a shallow decoder. Uh, but I guess those engineering shapes or those kind of uh, easy ideas sometimes are publishable, but uh, um, it's not necessarily. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, it also depends on the length in your data set. If your length is, let's say, a thousand, then even if you predict word by word, for well, one decoder is very slow. But also, uh, if it's a thousand words, then non-aggressive performance, the gap may be much larger. So it's really empirical. My hope is, um, I, I guess Pascal knows me well, <laughs> my hope is still to design some principled approach uh, on the problem. For example, for non-aggressive generation, we feel controlling different aspects is something it can do. If you can do different types of controlling, it doesn't really matter what the underlying model is. So that's what I feel from 